we're concluding this morning the vital signs of a healthy Christian and thus the vital signs of a healthy church. And what I think is amazing as we go through these, we'll find that one little word would sum up all ten of them, and that is that a healthy Christian is one who has been deeply infused with the life-transforming love of Jesus Christ. As the first century drew to a close, it must have been an awesome thing to have been on that galley ship as it crossed the Aegean Sea to the highest security prison colony of the Roman Empire where no one ever escaped. It was called the Isle of Patmos. And as that Roman centurion given the duty of taking one of the great political prisoners of the day back to his freedom, he had survived the long term of banishment to this prison colony that had been given him by the emperor. He must have been surprised to see the wizened, old, white-haired, wrinkled skin burned by the sun, bent over figure that hobbled onto that galley ship. His name was the Apostle John. He was the last of the twelve captains of the master that had overcome the Roman Empire. Although they didn't know it, the heavy boot of Rome had only caused the church to grow. And what the early historians tell us is that every time Rome would crush some Christians, much like a brush fire, the sparks would fan out and more would come to know Christ. Because, as the historian put it, when you hate them, they love. When you revile them, they bless you. When you curse them, they pray for you. And so there was nothing that Rome could do in their crushing to put out the fire. And the Apostle John, as we'll see when we conclude this morning, to his last day, preached the message that Christ left as the badge and the emblem of the church, and that is that they love one another. And thus a healthy and vital Christian life is based on these truths. And in Hebrews 13, we come to the concluding one of the uh, elements of the eighth uh, mark of a vital, healthy Christian. That is that they claim the same Father in heaven. Now what we saw last Sunday is that if you claim the same Father in heaven with other believers, there can never be any trace of any type of, of prejudice, any type of discrimination that's in the church of any kind. Also, if you claim the same father, thus we're in a new family, and thus we are now part of the house of God. But in Hebrews 13, and I want to start reading at verse 1, the final truth that we can derive from this vital sign of claiming the same father in heaven is that one who is vitally in contact with God will follow the divinely given leaders of that family. In Hebrews 13, the first 17 verses are a powerful statement. Better than any sermon is to actually read what the Word of God says. Follow along with me. Hebrews 13 and verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. Good start. Uh, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Hospitality is always to strangers. It's expected that we're nice to our friends. But the mark of the church is hospitality to strangers. And we're going to talk about that on Wednesday night because a disciple of Jesus Christ needs to know how to be hospitable. And the church grows in proportion to its hospitality to strangers. Not the club atmosphere, but the outreach atmosphere. Verse 3, or continuing in verse 2, By this some having entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also are in the body. Verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all. Let marriage bed, the marriage bed be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And in our society, we have to love so much that we tell people that if you have any type of sexual relationships of any kind before you're married, you're a fornicator. And if you have them after you're married with anyone but your lifelong partner, you're an adulterer. Trial marriages, live-ins, living together, trying it out, having fun, is all abominable in God's sight, and he will judge it. Verse 5, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Not when you get to the next level, you'll be content, or when you finally get you know, that goal. But right now, contentment is not an elusive thing you chase. It's a very present reality of people that love God so much they're happy where they are. 
Now, usually when you get happy where you are, he starts dumping so much on you that, that you don't know what to do with it all, and you have to start giving it away, which is the idea. But usually the people that are chasing more things never get it, and our world is filled with those people. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what shall man do to me? Now look at verse 7. Remember, those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Do you see the vital relationship in the early church? If you have the same father... That father, because uh, he has taken out of this world to his presence the Lord Jesus Christ, left in Christ's place those who were to be under shepherds of Christ, those who were to lead his church. And the Bible says that you're not to follow uh, whoever is the glibest or whoever is the loudest or whoever is the power base in the church. You're, you're to follow those, verse 7, who spoke the word of God to you. Imitate their faith. Now he continues, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. The greatest danger the church has is from false teaching, from people perniciously who enter the church and teach something that is not orthodox. It's not straight. It doesn't line up with biblical doctrine. And in our modern-day Christianity, there is such a vacuous uh, nature of the church that people don't even know doctrine or if they're heavy on the doctrine they're, they're into theological drift and they're, they're into doctrines the Bible doesn't even teach but rather than healthy wholesome teaching continuing look at verse 4 excuse me 14 for here we do not have a lasting city but we're seeking the city which is to come verse 15 through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips they give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing. God says it's so crucial that, that all the possessions we have are loosely held on to. I was blessed. Uh, I gave my, my monthly lecture to the kids as we pay them off for being in our family. We don't give them allowances for work. They don't get paid to work. They have to work for free. But for being in our family, we give them an allowance. And then we always say, give something to the Lord. And uh, my children weren't even sitting with me, and I couldn't believe it. One of the families they were sitting with says, do you know how much they put in? I said, no. He said, they put in a $10 bill. I says, I can't believe they gave their whole month's allowance away. But I guess they were just moved along with the desire to give. It says here, just have that ready spirit to share. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Now here's the, the hard hitter. And this is something that people in the church need to learn. It doesn't preface, verse 17 is not prefaced with, if you like them, if they're saying what you want to hear, if they're going the direction you want to go. It just says this, bang, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. And a lot of people have never learned to submit in marriage, women to their husbands, men in loving submission to their wives. Therefore, and children to their parents, therefore, when they come to the church, they're rankly unsubmissive. And so when they're told the direction to go, when they're told that the Lord has led this church to do this or that, they bristle and go back just like they do in their marriages and just like they do in their, their jobs or with their parents. But the Bible says that Christians are characterized by being obedient and submissive. What our world calls uh, milk toast, what the world calls wimpy, is what God says is great strength. There's great strength in submitting the keeping of your life to God. Then when someone mistreats you, they have God to reckon with. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. You see, the greatest thing you can do to those who govern over you, to the board of overseers, is obey them and pray. And if they do anything wrong, they won't get your puny little response. They will get God's whack. You understand that? Withhold your disagreement so that God can correct if correction is needed. And that's the biblical concept. It says, for they keep watch over your souls. And here's to be the character. And, and you can look out at the nominations and, and you should scrutinize these. And there's a provision in our bylaws. If there's somebody on that list that doesn't match up with the Bible, you're supposed to, to write Mr. Remington and let him know. Why? Because it says here, this is their character. They keep watch over you as those who will give an account if a man is elevated to the, to the 
lowest servant level of the church because the Lord says the one that serves the most is, is uh, the one who is the greatest servant. If they are lower to, to being the servant, the bond servant of the body, they are going to give an account for that. Now there's a special crown to be gotten and if a man is a shepherd of the flock, there is a crown he can get that no one else in the church can get and that's because it's such a hard job. But it says they are going to give an account for you. Now, verse 17 continues, let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. You know who the real loser is of the people that carry on and, and rant and rave and are always causing division? They're the real losers because God will deal with them. The murmurers in the Old Testament were the ones that God burned up. Now, aren't we thankful we're not in the Old Covenant? <laughs> there might be fires burning around here because God literally sent fire and burned them. That's how much he thinks of murmuring. The Hebrew word for murmur is marmar. It's one of those ana, mana, Paetic words. It sounds like, like, what it's describing. Mar 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 mar. mar. You ever seen people doing that? Uh, you know what's bad about that? You can get in the habit of that, and so even when you're happy, you're going mar mar mar. You know, and you look murmurish. And the Bible says, don't do that. It says, be lining up. Submissive means line up behind them. Get right behind them. And whether you agree or not, that's not in the formula. It's submit, love, obey. That's what the scriptures say. Now, go two more books over to 1 Peter. Because another powerful verse along this line, Peter adds, uh, he tells about some of the ones that will be a problem. And he says, especially in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, and, and I like the way that the uh, New King James puts this, 1 Peter 5, 5 says this, Likewise, you younger people, I mean, you that think you know everything, right? The older I get, the more I realize, the, little I, the, the less I know, because there's so much to be known and to, to understand, and, and it's, the Bible is so massive, but sometimes young people think they know everything. They know the best way to do everything. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So what is the vital sign of a healthy Christian? Well, they call on the same Father. And if you're calling on the same Father, then the people that are likewise calling on the same Father with you, you will never have respect to persons. You won't think some are great and some are to be used. You will have no type of, of prejudice. You will realize you're in the same family. You will realize that you are called by the same Father. You will realize that you're in the household of God, and therefore you are to focus on following your leaders. And the key of a healthy, vital, biblical church is not one that has rancorous congregational meetings. It's not one that's known as being able to uh, run their pastor out of town, as some churches are well known for doing. It's a group of people that are lovingly submitting in obedience to their leaders. And they're leaving the, the care of their leaders for any mistakes they make to the Lord. Now it doesn't say, though, that if someone is involved in, in moral default or if they're involved in, in some type of, of gross, wicked activity, they're supposed to be exposed before all. But as far as not liking them or disagreeing with them, God says, leave that to me. I'll work on their hearts. You work on yours. So, the eighth facet of a healthy Christian is one they call in the same father. And that's really crystallized by the fact that they follow the leaders that their father has put over them. Uh, turn back to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11, because uh, real quickly, I'm going to cover the ninth one before we get into the one that, that really captivated my attention this week. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11 lists for us the, the, ninth, the ninth vital sign of a healthy member of the body of Christ, and that is that they call other family members brother and sister. There is no title that is more prevalent in the New Testament of referring for Christians by other Christians than the title of brother and sister, and the church is collectively called the Brethren. And that's why there's a denomination now called the Brethren Church, because that was such a, a biblical concept. But, but what's powerful about this is Hebrews 2.11 and we'd alluded to this uh, a couple times ago about another point, but this is powerful. Listen to this, Hebrews 2.11. For both he who sanctifies 
and those who are sanctified, that's us and God, are all from one Father. Uh, God the Spirit sanctifies us. The Lord Jesus Christ says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in, in John seventeen eleven, sanctify them through thy truth, Father. So, so the sanctification comes by the Spirit energizing the word to obedient hearts. And so both the Spirit that sanctifies us, the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price of sanctification, all are from one Father, as those of us, verse 11 says, who are sanctified, the believers. Listen. For which reason, verse 11 concludes, he, that's God, is not ashamed to call us brethren. Now that's amazing. I remember in my university days being part of a, a brotherhood, a fraternity. And I remember how we would all be, you know, society brothers. You know, and it was just, boy, we cheered for one another. We stuck together. We wore, you know, our, our Greek uh, letters on our jerseys. And it was a big deal. And, and you're really in trouble if you didn't stick up for your society. And I know that in a good and loving family, it's the same way. Uh, when you're on the playground, if someone pushes your sister, you know, you deck them because you're protecting your sister. Lovingly deck them, but you deck them. Uh, at the bus stop, when you're bad, you know, you're always protecting one another. And, and for a while there, the girls are bigger than the boys, so your big sister protects you, you know, until you catch up. But you're not ashamed of your family. Well, in a, in a, in a loftier sense, in a sublime sense, we are the brethren of God. He's not ashamed of us. And he says, if you're healthy, you won't be ashamed of him or of all of his other children. And there's something wonderful about that. Now turn back to John chapter 13, because I want to show you why this is in the church. The 13th chapter of John has been aptly entitled by uh, students of the Word of God, The Legacy of Christ. The Legacy of Christ. And when Christ was leaving, by the way, the, the 12th chapter ends Christ's public ministry in 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 are all the, the, the concluding hours of his life and death, burial, and resurrection. And then 21 has his, his uh, ministry, those last 40 days. But this is his legacy. This is him giving the deepest and most precious truths to his disciples. And here's what he says in chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now look at verse 35, and it should be underlined in your Bible if it's not already. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The church is to love the other children of God. They are all members of one body. They are all begotten from the same Father. They are all regenerated through the same Spirit. And that Spirit implants within us and, and actually sheds abroad, is the way that it says in, in Romans 5, through us the very love of God. And so we are to call one another by that beloved term, brother and sister. It's even a great way to witness. I can remember at different times... Uh, I, I visit different men in the church at their works. I call it my work stop ministry. I go out to lunch with them and I'll pick them up in these, you know, massive uh, steel and glass buildings some of them work in and, and the receptionist. Some, some of the people in our church, you have to go through about six people to get to them, you know. Uh, they're, they're, I guess they're big wigs or something, I don't know. But, you know, you, you go through all these levels to get to them and uh, they say, yes, who would you like? And I tell them, they say, well, he's my brother. And they go, oh, he's your brother? Yeah, he is. I didn't know that. Well, you don't even look alike. I says, it's my brother. And finally, when the person comes up, they say, your brother's here. And they go, yeah, it's my brother. And they go, I didn't know that. And it, what a wide open door to tell them about how two people that have never met until they met in Christ are now related. And how we are to have that affectionate term of endearment for one another, brother and sister. We are brethren. Here's the last one. And let's... Uh, keep right there in John 13 and turn over to verse 15 or chapter 15 and look at chapter 15 of John's gospel chapter 15 and verse 12 because the final vital sign of a healthy member of the body of Christ is that they and this sums them all up they love all of the other members of the family and in just a moment I'll show you how every one of these um, ties together with love but I want to show you three definite 
ways that love ties us together. Number one, the church was founded on love. Verse 12 of chapter 15 says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Isn't that neat? Remember how nice it was to to see that, that Abraham was called the friend of God? He's always known as that, right? The friend of God. You know what Jesus said in verse 13? Uh, or verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You want to be God's friend? Do what he commands. What does he command? Love others more than yourself. Our world says love yourself. Put yourself at the front of the line. Grab your piece of life first and get the biggest one. You know what God says? Put yourself at the end of the life, uh, at the end of the line. Don't grab any pieces. And if you happen to have a piece, why don't you share it with someone else in line? He said it's unnatural in this world to be that way. Look at the next verse, 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have learned, heard from my father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. Now, glance over at verse 17. This I command you that you love one another. The church was founded. It was put on the foundation of the love of Jesus Christ. Now turn back to 2 Thessalonians. Just a couple more verses before we go. 2 Thessalonians. That's near the end of the epistles. Chapter 3, verse 6. Because the scriptures tell us that we are to love one another. That's what the church was founded on. But also, it wasn't just in the founding father's statement. And you know, we really drift far from where we are founded, as you can see in our country today. You can interpret the Constitution any way you want, as long as it's in public policy, and and all of the public agrees with it, or at least more than half of them. Uh, But that's not how it is in the church. The church remains true to its foundation. It's built on the uh, rock Christ Jesus, which is laid upon the foundation, or the foundation is built on that rock, which are the writings of the apostles and prophets. So we are built on the foundation of Christ with his word, which is this book, the Bible. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, look at this. The church is a family of love. It says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, brothers, you notice how he says that, that term of endearment, to keep away from every brother who is idle and doesn't live according to the teachings you receive from us. It's such a loving family, it doesn't excuse sin. It doesn't overlook sin. It doesn't sweep it under the carpet. It doesn't say, well, it's not my place. The church is so loving of a family that if you see a child that's going to put their hand on the stove, you pull their hand away, right, parents? If you see a little child that's walking between parked cars and going to get run over, you grab them, you jerk them out of the way, and, and you explain to them later why. The church is to love each other so much there has to be such a loving family that they call one another brethren, brothers and sisters, but they also get involved in the other people's lives. And, and it says here, this is, this is church discipline, it says stay away from people that, that are disobeying God. And if you love them so much, you will stay away from them. If they are called a Christian and they're in fornication, stay away from them. If they're called a Christian and they're not obeying the word of God, stay away from them. If they're a Christian, every time they talk to you, they're, they're dumping all the bile of their gossip. Just say, I'm, I can't talk to you. You know, you pollute my holy desire for God by your constant... uh, You know, have you ever met some people like that? The first word out of their mouth is, have you heard what? And then they just go right into it. He says, stay away from them. You love them so much that you separate from them so that they will be guilty about that. Here's the last verse, and we'll be done. 1 John chapter 4. And this really sums it all up. 1 John chapter 4. Our badge of identification is love. If you've ever been in a high security area, I remember once going into the Pentagon with a friend of mine who was, um, he was over a division that, that communicated with all the atomic submarines while they were still under the water. They'd let this little wire float up to the surface and, and the Pentagon was always communicating with them and, and uh, making sure they had this big entire wall of the world and they would have blinking uh, I forget the colors, but one color was for the for our forces, and maybe the red ones were for the bad guys. I can't remember. But I remember getting in there was a major thing. He had all these identification tags, and he had to keep, you know, explaining and and uh, and letting me go until finally his coverage or clearance couldn't take me any further, and I had to stop, and he could keep going. 
But I remember that he had a badge of identification with his picture on it and his classification and how top secret he could be and I guess how far he could take outsiders into the top secrecy. Well, in 1 John 4, starting in verse 7, here is the badge, here is our, our identification in God. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And when there's hatred and strife and variance and sedition and, and, and all sorts of division, it's not from God. In fact, every time if you get into some discussion and it starts getting awful and it starts getting uh, combative and there's selfish ambition hitting, James put it this way. He says this love or this, this spirit doesn't come from above. It's coming from beneath. It's coming from Satan. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. And that's why in our fellowship, if we love one another, no matter how strongly you disagree with something, you will never act demonic about it. You will never fight and divide. And the Bible says, because God is love, and the one who does not love does not know God. Verse 8, verse 9, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. A Christian is one who lives through Christ. They cling to Christ. Verse 14, and we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son, and he is the Savior of the world. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You see, we cling to Christ and we confess we belong to him. And the way we confess we belong to him, verse 16, And we have come to know and believe that the love which God has for us, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. As far as we know, John was dismissed by the emperor from the Isle of Patmos, as I talked about at the beginning. He was weak, he was old, he was long in in his life near the end. And he spent his last days at Ephesus with Mary, the mother of our Lord, with Timothy, who was the pastor at Ephesus. And the Apostle John lived his last days. And Jerome, the the great church historian from the 4th century, tells us that to his dying day, he used to be carried in on a stretcher to the church. And all the way in, you could hear him say, love one another, love one another one another. When he would get up to speak, he'd say, the one thing I never was able to forget that Christ taught us was, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Well, someone that's loving one another will be someone that, number one, feels for one another. They'll feel for other Christians. They will love each other so much. Secondly, they'll long to see each other. And there'll be a, a deep longing. Thirdly, They will love each other so much that they will give sacrificially to what the family needs. And and there's nothing that is too precious to give if you love. And that's why sacrifice comes from love. Fourthly, they will love so much that they will pray for one another with understanding. If you love God and love one another, you will gather whenever the family meets. And basically this, we are praying that there will be so much an overflow of love that even those who are only peripherally or, or ancillarily or just on the fringe connected with the body will feel that love and that they will long together when the family meets. And they will long to minister to one another and to feel for one another and to pray for one another and to give themselves. Sixthly, if you have that love, you'll encourage one another. Seventh, you'll eat, you'll share, you'll fellowship with other members of the body. You'll call in the same father. You'll call one another brother and sister because you love one another. Let me ask you this morning, how's your health? How are your vital signs? Is the love of Christ coursing through you? If you don't have the love of God, you're none of his. If you have the love of God, you'll feel and long and pray and give and gather and you will seek out the best for the other members of the body of Christ. Let's bow forward to prayer this morning. And dear Lord, as the scripture writers say, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep us in your love, made overflow into every dimension of our existence. For Jesus' sake, amen. 